Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our, our next webinar, uh, our second for the year, Real Estate Update from Those Who Know. Um, my name's Ben Flynn, and you know me as uh, the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, which is a very privileged position to be in. Um, certainly, at the moment, living through these times, having a, a bit of a bird's eye view of what's going on, and um, it sometimes feels like there's no rhyme or reason, and that's especially prevalent in the, in the real estate market. So hopefully, we learn a few things today to try and um, put the chaos in order. I'd like to firstly start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Wathorong people, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to start off by saying a big thank you to our platinum partner, Pixel, for all their support, as well as all of our corporate partners and members for helping the Chamber to be able to do things like this and everything else that we do for, for businesses across Geelong. I'm pleased to welcome our guest today, starting with Michael DiStefano, Director of Gartland Property and Board Director of the Chamber. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me on and nice to see uh, some familiar names on the, uh, the attendance list, so welcome all. Uh, also, Kevin Yip, who's the Senior Relationship Manager of Westpac. Welcome, Kevin. G'day, Ben. Nice to be involved. And Gareth Kent, who's the Director of Preston Row Patterson. Uh, welcome, Gareth. Thank you, Ben. Welcome. So today's 30 minutes, guys, and um, I really encourage people from the audience to use the Q&A function or chat function to post any questions they might have, um, and we'll try and get to them along the line. But let's just start by kicking off, Michael. Gartland Property, uh, been in the thick of it certainly for the last couple of years. How's, how are you finding this year? Uh, busier, to be honest. Um, it, it, it certainly is a, is, a, is a changed market, only for the fact that I think there's, there's more property on the market than this time last year. Um, so, you know, when, when we are rolling up to auctions rather than having five and six and a bit of, you know, bidders and a bit of that panic buying, it's probably returning to a bit more of a normalized market just with higher prices. But some of the results are still outstanding. Um, the, the, Melbourne, the Melbourne movement is still as prevalent as it was when we we're in lockdowns. Um, I'm actually probably finding it's more prevalent now that the dust is starting to settle somewhat. Are they investors, Michael, or people looking to move down? Uh, both. Both. I, I think from a residential perspective, you know, we've heard about the sea or tree change um, quite a lot over the last two years, but mm. probably what we haven't heard being um, advertised or, or spoken to much is the actual the investment um, money being, being um, invested down this way from, from abroad. Mm -hmm. um, I reckon from, and I'm talking commercially speaking here, um, I reckon probably about 60% of my buyers are now Melbourne based, um, wow. which is, which is a figure that continues to, to actually grow. And, you know, we used to say the secret's out, but it's well and truly out now. So the, um, the investment dollars, you know, the locals are, have got a lot more competition now. And are you finding, so that's residential you're referring to, are you finding commercial property, um, is that on the same plain is residential well conversely with, with commercial property what we're finding is the stock levels commercially haven't grown over that two years they've stayed at really low levels mm. um, which has provided um, a lot of competition so the one sector that's been uh, you know has gone from probably a low base to you know it's probably an industry that i reckon over the last two years has has probably doubled has been in, in industrial sector yeah. Um, the you know we're reselling the same product in some you know in some elements where we're actually you know um, anecdotally I can tell you like there's been warehouses that we've sold for about eight hundred thousand probably eight months ago and reselling them now at about one point three wow. so the, the interest um, in industrial product has been has been immense and there's a number of reasons behind that it's been that the tendencies in behind that. Uh, that occupy those buildings over the COVID period were, were generally fairly immune to the um, deferrals and moratoriums that were in place by federal government. The returns are generally a bit higher and, and you, you still get the benefit of your tenant paying out going. So we've seen a flock of investors come to the you know, industrial market. And are you finding that's making it hard for local businesses to expand or to move their operations? Uh, well, it is, but it, probably the most challenging thing at the moment is just stock levels. Um, you know, I, I probably feel feel about you know ten five to ten inquiries for people looking for industrial product that you just can't service at the moment. Mm. So, 
um, you know, at the, the start of the pandemic, it, there was a glut of um, industrial product on the market to the, to the extent where we, you know, from, a, from an agency perspective, I thought we're, we're a little bit exposed in terms of how much stock we're carrying in that segment. And in the blink of an eye, it's all gone. And that's what everybody's screaming for. So um, it's probably the stock that's holding back that segment at the moment. Yeah, okay. Now, Gareth, uh, you guys operate in 31 locations around Australia. Um, is this, this isn't just a Geelong story, is it? No, no, not at all. And, and you couldn't even say that Geelong's at the at the front of it either. Like we're, we're actually not at the front of the pack. People think that Geelong's because we had all the population growth and all the rest of the things that, that Geelong should be really leading the whole country and this sort of stuff. And people talk that way, but we're actually not. You've got places like Hobart and Brisbane that have experienced huge amounts of growth. I mean, Hobart was 29.8% growth in residential property median price last year. So um, Geelong sits around 20%. Um, the surf coast is obviously a bit higher than that. The surf coast around 30%. So, so you've had different regions, different reactions, um, but you've certainly seen a huge shift in population from the major cities of Sydney and Melbourne, which is um, really what drives that, that increase in demand that we're seeing across most markets. And the supply um, in all these areas like the regions like Hobart, even Geelong, even we don't have that supply up our sleeves. So that's just keeps pushing the prices and keeps pushing the prices up. Um, and we're seeing, you know, people think that and keep talking about, oh, this market might tank, this market might tank. Well, the thing is mortgage delinquency rates are actually down last year mm. than they were the year before. So so even though we've had huge price jumps, it's, it's they've mostly been um, in line with price jumps in other places. And we haven't mm. seen a huge increase in mortgage possessions or delinquencies on loans. So it's it's actually not been uh, it's it has been a jump. It's a change of it's a change of um, of value ranges, but um, it's not outside the box. Yeah, well, that's that that was that was my next question was um, how do you think it'll hold up over the next two years, given that Geelong effectively isn't an outlier here. This is actually normal yeah. market conditions. I don't think it's an outlier. And, and the other thing is um, we're going into, as Mike just said, we're going to a much more balanced market where we're going to see a slowdown of this demand a little bit as, as COVID gets dealt with and people get asked to come back to the office. You know, pop, um, values and value shifts always f- follow uh, population movement and, and use, right? And so people going back to the office will have an impact on people's decisions to move down the coast mm. or to, you know, that sort of thing. So we're going to, I think there was a stat out today on the radio that this, the number of suits sold at uh um, has peaked at 60% above. So, you know, that's, so you can see that people are preparing to go back to the office in a lot of ways. And that's playing into their theory about property and where they're buying them, their minds are on other things. But if you ask me, that's just a more balanced approach to, to the property. As values, we don't like seeing huge increases in jumps in property values. That just leads to a problem at a later point. So if we can come into a more balanced market over the next 12 to 18 months, I think that's a very healthy place to be. So do you think there's merit in some of the banks coming out and sort of suggesting that interest rates and, and you know, and, and APRA and, and, and so on are going to have a, a downward pressure on prices in the next year or two? I think interest rates always have an impact on on, 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 value, on property prices a little bit in terms of people's ability to buy and borrow. I think what's more going to have an impact is the upcoming elections. We've yep. got two elections in a row. We generally get a slowdown a very big slowdown in elections and we've got two back to back. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see the outcomes of those. We've got one state government that's very heavy on their principles around taxation and taxing taxing property and taxing mm-hmm. land and all that sort of thing that play to the property market. And, we're, and we've got another government on the other side on a federal scheme that's looking at doing housing um, you know, giving giving first home buyers grants and things like that. So there's quite a few things at play over the next six months that will change and have an impact on the market. I don't think any of those are going to have drastic negative impacts, but we will see a slowdown just because of those. Interest rates, to be honest, I think they're low. I think that if people, mm. the APRA has been factoring in a, a um, interest rate of about 5% when they offer you a loan anyway. So until, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on borrowing, but Kev might be the guy to tell you more about that. Welcome, Kev. Nice segue. Thank you, uh, Gareth. Um, Kev, how are you finding things? How are, how are people going about getting finance and, and what's happening on your end with the bank? Yeah, sure. I mean, from just personally, what I'm seeing in, in the marketplace is that I think all banks are, are coming to the party. You know, we're all ready and open for business and it just depends whether, one, um, you know, we understand the business and then, two, um, understanding the whole market scenario as well 
Um, finance is out there and, and obviously each bank's, they have their own appetite situation as well. So that's taken into account, but all in all, you know, um, and only I can speak from myself personally is that through the whole COVID proposition that we've just come out of, um, the appetite from my customer base is, has always been strong. Might've just stalled for a little bit with that bit of uncertainty, whether we're going to come out, what the government's going to factor in. But um, all I can say is that, you know, it, it has been pretty active within my per personal portfolio and um, I think it's only going to get stronger and I don't see um, with where people are thinking the rates are going to be. I don't see that as a slowdown. It's just going to be a, a hurdle or a, um, a, a segment that, you know, people are going to have to factor into their, to their borrowing needs and causes. Yeah. Are you still um, at, at the bank? Are you still um, providing, I suppose, um, leniency for, for businesses or, or uh, holidays and loan holidays for people who are struggling to sort of get back on their feet after COVID? Yeah, I think it's all on a case by case situation. And, and again, just personally, I don't, I've never seen a bank sort of move on, on a customer in, in that situation. We've always mm -hmm. been there to try and help them through that. Firstly, understanding where they've come from. And then secondly, understanding a way out or a way to trade out of that. Um, and again, it, it's just each case that presents itself. And then we've got to justify that on its own merits, but we also have, and, and I believe other banks do until the 30th of June, is that um, that business loan, which is backed by the government as well. Mm. Um, so that's been a key driver for us to, to provide um, some assistance there for customers in need. Yeah. Um, and, and on the flip side, how do you, you know, how do you feel when they, they talk about expanding the home builder scheme and, and things like that? Is, um, is that just driving people to you? And, um, you know, yeah, yeah. So I guess the, the home the home side or the residential side, um, our business is mainly driven with commercial, but mm. or from, I guess, some customers who deal within that sort of project side of, the, of, of this um, Geelong area, a lot of stock is just taken off the market straight away. So can only go off what, what I visually see and um, there's just not enough stock for the demand mm. out there. So... Um, and I'm sure, you know, Gareth and Michael have seen the same. There's people waiting outside way before. Yeah, we well, only, only, only have to look at the new ID land development down in Finesford. Mm. I've contacted mm. people yesterday. They're going to release a new stage there. There's already a waiting list before they even go to market. Wow. There's, there's, yeah. there's waiting lists in most stages. There's, um, I think the UDI, Mike, said that there was about 2.5 years worth of growth left in Geelong of the land that's available to be developed. And mm. it's nowhere near enough to to deal with the amount of um, volume that's, that's, that's required in the marketplace for supply. So we have got a massive issue. And I think that, um, you know, we've got to call out, for, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and other groups, industry groups need to start calling out to the state government to, you know, push some of these planning processes forward. Mm. Um, and, and it's playing into other things like affordable housing and other things becoming a big, big issue in this location because we've got no supply of the cheaper stuff. Um, yep. Everything's just getting pushed up. Yep. I think on that, we've also identified there's going to be a break in the market. Uh, Gareth alluded in the sense of that the demand is outstripping how quickly they, you know, they can supply the land. Mm. And our, the next growth corridors out at Lovely Banks, et cetera, they're not probably due to come online until about 2025. So there's going to be probably about a year there that land's going to be really, really tight. And that's only going to drive prices further up. So, I mean, then you've got to look at how else can we supply growth if we don't have land available. And you've got to look at to the planning regulations around um, going up, you know, being able to build up. Um, and we've just had government curtail that in Geelong. So with the Central Geelong Framework Plan that still hasn't been released, mm. it's now been sitting with the Richard Wynn, the minister since uh, 23rd of December. These things normally go to the minister for one to two months and he's now had it for three to four months. We, we need to see... That advice, we need that that planning, whatever it is, has to come out and be given to stakeholders so they can start building properties to to fill the gap that we're going to have in this town very very soon. And even then, we'll take twelve to eighteen months to get stuff out of the ground. And so, and Gareth and Michael, um, with that, are you are you stressing the importance of maybe someone from Geelong to be on that panel as well? Because it seems that in the past, um, people who make these decisions, especially for our area, 
aren't essentially from Geelong. So they're missing the whole concept and, and the need and the growth and demand of, of Geelong. So they're making these decisions sort of, you know, unseen. Yeah. We, we do know that we've got pretty strong advocacy groups with the Chamber of Commerce and with G21 and with the, um, these other groups. Um, the, but the, pan, the, the planning for these growth, for, for example, the Central Geelong Framework Plan is done by state government and it's done the, the, the panel hearing that all went through Geelong last year. There wasn't a single person from Geelong on the panel, mm. which was pretty frustrating to nearly all stakeholders. So I, I completely agree with you, Kevin, but I think the horse has bolted on the panels. It's time to get the actual result out. Just get it out. Whatever it is, just get it out so we've got some certainty in the market. It's, it's probably yeah. held up, sorry, Ben, it's probably held up development in terms of high-rise development in the CBD for probably about 18 months. Yeah. So there's been uncertainty in terms of what projects can look like. I think the thing that we identified was when we were talking about the, the Geelong Authority that do consult state government on, on matters like this, that there's not one developer um, or CBD developer on that that can give their perspective. So certainly to, to your point, Kevin, I think that's something that's been you know, uh, blaringly obvious. Can I get back, can, in, in relation to the CBD, um, so the, for people that don't know, we're, we're planning to have 12,000 people living in the CBD um, <laughs> at some time in the future. And I know, you know, you, you've I mentioned think, some, some of the blockers and at the moment we've got 4,000. Um, how do you see, you know, forgetting about, you know, the Geelong Authority, Authority and, and Richard Wynn and everything at the moment, how do you see that actually affecting our city is it, is it going to make it more vibrant and 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 what a price is going to sort of a price is going to hold hold up in the city or will increased supply sort of um affect those we're, we're desperate for more foot traffic in the cbd right now that the more foot traffic we have the better the more vibrancy of the businesses i think mike we looked at a statistic a week or so ago where there was 70 to 80 percent of foot traffic counts were from people that work in the city rather than live in the city mm. and that that's a big problem when a lot of those authorities aren't coming back to work on a full-time basis mm. And look, pre-COVID, so let's go back two years, you can see the momentum really and the upswing coming into the CBD, which took some time to come. For years prior, you know, the, the, no, the notion of apartments in the CBD was, was, was weak, but then it took two developers to come in uh, with the Mercer and uh, Miramar to see just how well um, the uptake was. And now we've got a third one at Rory Home that's, I would be like close to eighty-five percent sold, you know, with with floors. I think I, I think it's higher than that now. I think they're pretty well yeah. sold out or close to. So you know, regardless of height, the appetite is certainly there. I think you said four thousand. I think it's only about two and a half thousand. So the mandate to have twelve thousand by twenty thirty, time's running out, and mm. that, that's why I think um, I think the amount of um, apartments will be absorbed in the market with protecting price mm. because as we alluded we've got that um, the urban sprawl we're running out of um, a property to sell essentially and affordable housing so rather than and, and the blocks are getting smaller and smaller and smaller you know I think the average uh, block size now in Armstrong Creek is under 300 square meters wow so the um, you know the apartment market is a is a real alternative, and you know to and, to, to and that's a good that's a good point. We just looked at some sale prices in Torquay, for example, in a new estate that's going out in the Torquay. They're four hundred and forty square meter lots. They're selling them for six hundred and seventy thousand a lot. Now, in, in comparison, that's that's fifteen thousand a square fifteen hundred a square meter or just over. It, it's pretty high numbers. And and when you talk about an apartment in the CBD, you can be much closer to things, you know, for similar if not much more money with a, with it with it finished. I mean, now out at Torquay to have a property there, you're talking one point two to one point three million by the time you're in, and and you can get a cheaper option in the CBD. Um, with some of the apartments. So I think that there is a gap in the market between what you can build and own a house for and what apartments are. I mean, apartments in Geelong are selling between 7,500 to 13,000 a square metre. Um, and if you have a look on what it has that comparative to Melbourne and other places, we're still a long way behind mm. on, on that market. Um, the biggest challenge to these guys is going to be construction prices. If they keep going up, that might make doing apartments in Geelong just unfeasible again, um, which is the situation we were in when we did the waterfront, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Fascinating. And, and Michael, uh, I'll get just with, with commercial tenancies in, um, I always sort of hit you up on this question, but how's it all travelling and, and how is the CBD looking for small businesses? Um, look, I'm, I'm really amazed of the, 
resolve and resilience of the CBD businesses, to be honest. Like we've seen very little businesses uh, fold, uh, very few, and how they've done it in a market where there is still no CBD traffic is sort of, um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty impressed, to be honest. But um, I, I think we're still in a bit of a holding pack pattern. And I think this is where state government really needs to sort of take a lead in, in, in enforce, enforcing or, or coming to uh, the party and sending uh, those government agencies back back into the CBD. I think between the uh, NDIA, WorkSafe, TAC, then you've got your council officers that won't make a ruling outside of what state government do. You know, yeah. out of just those few government agencies, I think there's probably about five or more thousand people that aren't working in you know essentially two two you know two square uh, blocks of the CBD. And they're all people that aren't coming into shop, that aren't buying lunches, that aren't buying co coffee on a daily basis. So yeah. most of them are looking at coming back to a, a hybrid model next month, yeah. which is really needed. And I think, um, look, I think the future for the CBD is, is still very, very bright. And you've got to imagine too, Deakin has been pretty much offline as well in that time. So I think once things get back and activated, we're fielding interest from... Uh, companies that aren't in Geelong, the Sydney base, and all that, that are now looking in, in you know, inward to Geelong that we haven't seen before. So mm. I, I think fast forward, we can get a little bit more uh, space between you know the norm and COVID. I think you know the CBD future is going to be bright. And 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 a separate question, which I think is kind of interesting, and, and uh, you obviously have a lot of properties under management at, at Gartland as well, residential properties. So. Um, how hard is it for people to find rental properties in Geelong? Yeah. You know, it's tight when all these people that you haven't heard from from years uh, give you a call and say, can you put in a good word for us? Um, it, it is tight, Ben. Um, the competition for each for each property, um, you know, there's multiple, multiple applications received. I think, you know, for the, the portfolio of our size, I think currently if I was to say what was available, I think it's about five, five properties um, currently. So... Um, the competition and the price achieved at the moment is high. And I think any talk of interest rate rises and all that's going to make that residential, um, uh, you know, leasing market or management market even more competitive. So mm. I don't think that um, uh, that space will change in, in you know, any concern. And we did touch on social housing. I won't talk too much about it today, but we do acknowledge that that's going to be critical in terms of the infrastructure we need in this city moving forward as well to um, protect all our disadvantaged groups. Kevin, can I come back to you, mate, if you, if you don't mind? Um, banks are competitive beast. How competitive is it in the market at the moment now for, um, for people's patronage? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we are pretty competitive in the banks. We... we It'd be a lie if I said, you know, you, we don't know what our counterparts are doing at the four other three majors and and also the second tier and third tier banks. And everyone's got their place in the market for certain customers. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess myself personally, you know, if a, if a deal or a proposal comes across my desk, I am pretty competitive. So I just hate to lose. But then I've just got to bear in mind or anyone has to bear in mind when they're doing business is that it needs to be, the right proposal and it's always judged on a on a, on its own merits so um you know if it comes down to pricing it comes down to pricing but i always tell my customers is that the relationship piece comes first and i think it's the same mm -hmm. if michael and gareth and even yourself you know when you're dealing in businesses and you're building that network one relationship is key because if you feel like you can't talk to that person about mm -hmm. anything at all and be transparent then somewhere along that point it's going to come apart because I guess only from experience and, and, you know, being nearly 20 years in the banking industry, you can be the price winner, but then comes a certain point, if you're not going to win that, that deal on pricing, um, that customer is most likely going to go somewhere else. So the basic needs are understanding your customer, know what the business goals are, but then also personally, what keeps them up at night? What is driving them to succeed? Because if the business succeeds, then personally, they may get to spend more time at home with the family or, or go into another investment venture. And for me, it's really basic, just understanding what those goals and needs are first. And 
And that all coupled together, you know, it should put you or, you know, me in a really good position to win that business and, and be the number one competitor in the marketplace, which is, um, I guess, my mantra. Yep. Awesome. Um, Gareth, coming back to you, um, is it a good time to sell? Um, it's, I think it is still. I think it very much still is. Uh, there's still, as Mike said before, we're still seeing some really record prices. On the weekend, um, Candace, one of Michael's staff, sold a property in um, was it Hamlin Heights, Michael Hearn Hill, um, for $1.6 million. Um, and this house didn't have a double garage. It was a single garage with a carport, I believe. Um, it was a very nice renovated home. But that's a huge jump on house prices in there that mm. averaged 700000 So, So it's, um, yeah, there's still some really record prices. There's still people looking for quality homes and looking to get down here that just haven't had opportunities yet. I think that you would try and get in before the election um, and then try and see what happens through that period. But, um, yeah, I, st- I still think it's a really strong time to sell. Yeah. And for buyers, um, I was reading this morning that a lot of real estate agents uh, are actually receiving love letters from potential buyers um, trying to, <laughs> and Michael, no doubt you're smiling there. Um, but um, I think Michael know, gets love letters on a regular basis. Well, ben, so. Exactly. It's, it's quite normal for him, but for, for others. I, I um, send him one at least once a week. <laughs> for, for others, um, it really is. People are, are desperately looking to buy. What advice can you give the, for those poor people who are just getting pipped at the post every weekend? It's 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 one of those things, Ben. There's no secret formula. You just need to be active. You need to form the relationships. You need to know things coming on. But, but there's very little off-market transactions now because, you know, my advice is to take it to auction or put it on the market because you just don't know who's out there. So, you know, being, you know, first on the spot isn't really a thing at, at the moment because, you know, the succession rate, you know, I think uh, Victoria-based uh, clearance rates at auctions was about... 70% over the weekend, but it'd be even higher in Geelong. So mm. 85.3%, I think, Mike, on the weekend in Geelong. So, you know, um, you know, I think if we look back at our last 20 residential sales, I think 19 have been all that auction. So, um, you yeah, know, the advice is still, you know, it's a still a strong auction market. So it's just one of those things. Be, be you know, have, have your finance ready, be ready to pounce. Um, you know, because it is that market you need to be I think ready. I think that's the advice to buyers and probably goes back to Kev again. It's a good segue to you, Kev. But there is um what we see from evaluation then and is people trying to settle in 30, 60 days just having almost no luck doing it with the banks. They've to, people just got to get prepared and have their stuff done up front these days, don't they? That's to you, Kev. For me, yeah. Actually, um that's one of my notes, I guess, is you know. If anyone is looking for finance, looking to acquire property, and whether it be commercial or, pro- or residential, you know, um, just always be prepared. And a key thing, I guess, what banks are looking for now, and we are a heavily regulated industry, is you know, make sure, for example, your ATO portals are up to date. You know, they are cleared because even though there are schemes out there, and your advice by your accountant, and always take the advice of your accountant because bankers aren't paid to give advice out, but you know, we do like to see stat accounts up to date and be prepared with that financial information. So if you know that you are going to be in that position, make sure your accounts are, are prepared and, and covered off, you know, for the last financial year. Um, but most importantly, and I think that's the case for both parties, both your customer and your banker is everyone needs to be very transparent. So if there's any, any uh, you know, ghosts in the closet, make sure they're just laid out on the table from day one, because the worst thing that can happen is you go through that application process, a question comes up and that stalls the whole sort of settlement mm. process and, um, and you're back to square one. So put too much pressure on the valuers to do it too quickly too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually my final question for you all. And, and thank you. We, we are coming to an end. Um, but it, you guys have been super busy and all of your staff have been super busy for the last couple of years. And um, how's everyone feeling? Tired. <laughs> Tired. I think there's genuine burnout in, in, in our industry. But, uh, you know, we've been fortunate and blessed that over that pandemic, we've been really busy. So I think you've got to take the good and the bad with our industry. But, um, you know, we really encourage our people to, you know, there's flexibility because there's a lot of long hours in real estate. So, if it's late mornings and I've got guys that want to go for a run or, you know, start the morning with a surf or whatever, it's just, you need to be fresh and you need to be, 
you know, at your best for your clients. So, you know, we, we just provide the flexibility that, that people need to, to perform at their best. Yeah, I think I think that's a for an as an employer, it's the same thing. I mean, you've really got to become a lot more aware of what your employees are going through, what's their home life like, you know, all those mental stresses that you previously might not have had to think about or traditionally hadn't thought about. You know, where is their money going? How stressed are they? Are they most of your, your employees now are working at odd hours? So they may, you know, do five hours during the day and the other four or five hours at night time after dinner. Um, or some are working in the morning and starting at 5am and you know everybody's moving and doing things in a different way no one's working an eight-hour day between 8 30 and 5 30 anymore so it's that 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 comes with pressures that you've got to actually hold people back you've got to you've got to remind people to put themselves first and their families first and you've got to remind them not to be working past a certain time at night time and and that's actually the harder challenge not telling them to work it's actually telling them to slow down guys take a breath yeah, that's that's the biggest mm. problem. Yeah. And Kevin, think, how's um, everyone in the bank? You guys haven't shut down at all. No, yeah, I, I guess we we were we were lucky that we were had a forced closure over Christmas, which is is kind of good because you go 100 percent the whole year, and if we could, we probably would work through Christmas. But it was good to have that, and it's been in the bank now for a couple of years, where you take two weeks off, spend time yeah. with family, enjoy the weather. But um, reiterating, I guess Gareth's point is. You know, um, my regional manager said to me one day, he said, don't send any emails after hours. If you need to type it in or draft it because it's on your, in your mind, just do that. But just be cognizant of, you know, that person receiving it at that time. They can't do anything. Everyone's shut. So just send it off in the morning. But at least for you, if you need to write it, write it down. But, you know, send it during business hours. And I think that's probably the best thing or best advice I've ever been given. Yep. Just have that balance. Very good. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, and thank you to everyone else who joined in. Joined in. So Michael Stefano, Director of Garland Property. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And Kevin Yip, Senior Relationship Manager of Westpac. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Ben. Thanks a lot. And Gareth Kent, uh, who's the Director of Preston Road, Patterson. Uh, thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Ben. And have a great day, everybody, and good luck in the market. <laughs>